Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of Park Office Hours. Park a code of conduct applies. The gist of it, just be nice to each other. Actually, be excellent to each other. And if you want to read the details, you can check the Park Office Hours document, which should be attached to the calendar, but I will also uh, put the link in the chat. So yes, uh, if you have any agenda items, you can just put that uh, put those in the document as well. We already have an entry, and we are we have a couple of news, I guess for that. Uh, Matthias, do you want to take over? Sure. Um, I guess we don't have that on the agenda, but we kind of are celebrating one one and a half months of. Uh, development on Parker FrostDB and Parker Agent as we finally released release candidates. Is the Parker Agent a release candidate this way, uh, Kimai? Or is that? The pipeline is running. Uh, so probably in a couple of minutes, there will be a release if it's not fake. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, is, it, is it a release candidate or? Yeah, just... it's going to be a release yeah, candidate as one, well. Yeah. So yeah, yeah we so... changed our process for that. So we will be releasing release candidates and we'll give it uh, three days or so in our demo environment and we will uh, actually release the releases. Yep. And yeah, that's that's super exciting because so much stuff is in there. As I said, um, everything from from um, like FrostDB updates and UI updates and um, performance improvements all over the place, bug fixes all over the place, like everything, really. We, we touched everything, and there were so many great contributions coming from all places. So huge shout out to the open source community as well. Um, it's a big release. And yeah, I think it's it's good that we take this time to do uh, release candidates, and then, and then we can uh, take the proper releases, because, um, yeah. The, there are lots of changes, but we've been constantly running this on on different systems, on a demo cluster, etc. So hopefully there aren't big surprises. But um, yeah, make sure to if you run a Parker instance somewhere, please make sure to to update those to the release candidate. So in different environments, it might behave differently, and we might be able to catch some some uh, bugs upfront that we aren't seeing on our systems. Um, but yeah, I think that's anything to add for, for the releases. Go check out the uh, releases on, on GitHub. Um, and we, we also make sure to have, um, uh, we also make sure to have, um, highlighted con um, contributions, like the highlights of the releases that are more like user facing kind of centered. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's a good place to, to look at the releases. Um, and apparently, Frederick just posted we have 16 unique contributors um, to this release. Uh, that's super, super exciting. Um, yeah, so again, thank you and big shout out to the open source community for all the contributions. Shows again that open source is worth doing as always. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the features I want to um, quickly show, let me share my screen even more uh, contributors in FrostDB. Yeah, that could totally be true um, if we combine all, all of these, right? Yeah. OK, so um, the feature I want to show is actually um, was done by uh, Manoj, uh, one of the Parker maintainers and a co-worker at Polar Signals. Um, and I think we had this in Conprof previously, not as sophisticated, but it's super nice that this is back. So once you once you um, look at profiles and you you can still share URLs on local instances that everybody has access to, you can always just go to the browser, copy the URL, post the URL somewhere, and the other people will see the um, the profiles, right? But what's uh, super nice uh, that uh, Manoj has implemented is um, let's take all of the um, Parker server profiles that we have on the demo instance. And then um, we already have this feature to download pprof profiles. But now there is a feature uh, where you can click this button and you can say, OK, these are the CPU samples um, merged 
over time, over 15 minutes um, of the Kaka container, right? And what this will do, oh my God. <laughs> um, what this will do, it will just like this button up here, it will download the PPROF profile and then instantly share it um, with a sharing provider for, for profiles. And that is um, the pprof.me and you get this URL. And then if you open it, you get the, the profile that is publicly accessible. So if you use this feature, be aware it's like visible by everybody. Um, but then it's also super nice to be able to just take this profile and share it on GitHub, share it on some Slack for debugging purposes to be able to, to um, show this to, to people outside your organization, basically. Um, and then maybe, again, in the open source spirit, I think early on, I think Frederick uh, once discovered an open telemetry um, memory leak, right? Like in that open source spirit, if you discover something in any open source product, now it's super easy to to kind of like share a profile with the um, developers of that open source project again. Um, and that is on pprof.me, um, which we are hopefully going to revamp to the new Parker UI, et cetera. So this looks a bit dated, but we're going to work on this. Um, and just a quick kind of like um, disclaimer, uh, the way it's implemented is, um, when you, when you click this button, it will download the pprof profile as a zip file um, and actually kind of like do this request internally via gRPC basically. Um, and then it will take um, that pprof profile and upload that to a remote um, sharing host, right? So uh, that one is currently by default the pprof.me service um, that Polar Signals is running, but given this is an open source project, it's actually configurable. So um, I think, where's the main, main file? Uh, main.go. Oh, no, it's not the main.go, it's the packer, packer go. Yes, so in here you can have a flag, you can configure packer to use a different sharing service. Um, and then we are providing the protobuf APIs um, on buff.build, so you can find the, um, actually these are the wrong ones, <laughs> just realized now. Um, on buff.build slash polar signals slash API, um, we have the uh, protobuf files um, published where you can find the definitions. So if you wanna implement your own sharing service, that's that's still true given Park has an open source project, we want to to be transparent about this and, and make it easy to share. And you can also find this under Polar Signals APIs and next to some other APIs, we have the sharing service and there's the proto file. So, oops, let's click. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, there's no vendor login for Parka, so I just wanted to, to also point that out and, and be very transparent about this. The APIs are there. If you wanna implement your own sharing service, that's totally possible. Um, but yeah, thank you again for Manoj. He did all of this work also with the um, the APIs and, and make them public, uh, et cetera. So uh, great job uh, on Manoj's side. And I think that's one of the biggest kind of like user impacting features in the new Parker release. Any questions, anything to add from the other maintainers? Uh, Albert, I think you're talking, but I can't hear you. Or is it only me? Okay. No, we can't hear him. Okay. You guys hear me now? Yes. I'm sorry about that. Every time I hear in this situation. Um, I, had a, I had a question about it. Is, it. is this feature enabled by default? Because what I could foresee happening is like we would, so I'm working at a, a company that has a bunch of, I don't know, software that we want to keep kind of secure, I guess. Um, I say Parker looks cool. I turn this on. I go to the UI for the first time and I'm like, oh, this is great. And then I click like um, share and then instantly my pprof like goes to the public internet and I'm like, oh shoot, I didn't mean to do that. I totally goofed it. Um, you know what I mean? Like I, I could see that, I could see that like maybe happening. You know, I think I think it's a really cool feature. I'm not trying to like knock it because what I do all the time is I'm like downloading pprofs out of this, putting them in Slack and having other people download them. And it's kind of a bummer. But at the same time, I wouldn't want to like 
inter like I wouldn't want to introduce this in our organization just in case someone accidentally like logged in and clicked on it. Um, you, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. maybe, I don't know. It's it's tricky. I know for you guys because it's like a really great feature and you want to promote it, so you don't want to like ha like hide it behind some default configuration option. But um, anyway, just uh, just that would that would be my comment on it. I think it's really cool, super super awesome. Um, I'd be scared to use it accidentally. <laughs> is the only yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, we we you you're right on on, on track. We had this discussion uh, internally quite quite a bit, um, and um, yeah, it, it came up as well and. Kind of the the way we are um, for now handling this is with this note, as you can see. Like that's why we put the note in. We had this discussion internally. Um, I'm not sure if we like if you don't give the URL properly formatted or something. If you just give it like an empty string, we could do something where we disable this for organizations that deploy this and that they like explicitly want to disable um, this feature. We can definitely. Um, I don't think it's in this release, but it's really good feedback, and we can definitely put it into like a, a next release or a patch release. Um, I don't think it's a bug fix per se, but I mean we can still put it in. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, cool. Oh, I see. I see you've got the note there. Yeah, I must have spaced out and missed that when you did the demo the first time. But yeah, the note. I mean, I think it's cool. I you know I think any responsible engineer should probably read dialog boxes and. Not yeah, and that. that's that's one of the like when you don't when you're just like quickly doing something then you miss it and then it's still on the public internet, right? So um, if anyone uh, this uh, seeing this uh, and this happens to them, feel free to uh, just email Polar things and we can always delete these things. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's good feedback that we also should have the ability for everybody to disable this um, if they want to, so it doesn't actually. Uh, accidentally misfire for for like organizations where this is a bit higher of a priority. Cool, thanks guys. But other than that, very cool feature. Uh, <laughs> comes to uh, Manoj. I I think it's I I think it's uh, valid feedback though. Like it's it's kind of akin to the Grafana, like is it called snapshots? I think where you can kind of share a snapshot of a dashboard with others. And by default, it's on in Grafana. And you like if you take a snapshot, it uploads it to some Grafana endpoint. So I think we could do something similar. And th this feature is you can turn it off in Grafana. So I think we can do something similar where we have a flag to explicitly turn it off. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, then it wouldn't work. Um, I think it makes sense. And on on the other side, actually, what you just said, Matthias, I feel like we should probably have some sort of simple link um, on in the sh sharing UI to like request a deletion or something like that, right? Yeah, hundred percent agree. Like on the um, on here where you view a a profile, right? Yeah. 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 That makes sense as well. Like that's we can put that on the roadmap for when we rebuild this. We'll put this in, and then um, it will just send us an email automatically in the background. All right. I think that's it for this feature. Um, let's see. I don't think that we have anything other than that. I mean, we we have so many. Um, FrostDB uh, improvements we could talk about. Um, we have uh, many, uh, I don't know, like so many under the hood um, Parker uh, improvements that we can talk about. Um, yeah. Uh, other than that, I think we can also discuss the Parker agent updates a bit more. Um, so, anything to add on on that side? Yeah, we can briefly mention we haven't uh, released the release candidate, but there will be a comprehensive change log in that. Uh, but like most of the features, I guess they are not like user facing, but we made a lot of stability improvements. Plus, we are now uh, with this release using Rust and ABPF space. Uh, we got rid of uh, the local state. Uh, we believe this will uh, improve uh, you the stability of the Parker agent and like we are not using any temporary file system right now. So uh, 
we have a couple of issues uh, that like regarding uh, certain like uh, Kubernetes cluster vendors. Uh, we really want to uh, test this uh, release candidates uh, on those as well after these. Uh, so yeah, uh, I want to just like call out the community. If you just like watch this, just go and check out our release candidates and try to deploy them and give us feedback. Anything else uh, you want to discuss? Um, I was wondering if you could go over the um, FrostDB changes. What's new in FrostDB in the last uh, weeks or month or so? I think there are, there are a bunch of um, changes. Um, so in terms of features, I think uh, kind of the biggest one is uh, dynamic projections. So um, previously, when you did a projection, so like um, maybe for everyone else, I think you know, but I'm not sure everyone else knows. Um, what a projection in uh, FrostDB is essentially that you're saying, um, after all of these filters or whatever, uh, give me these columns. I want to see these columns. And one of the unique features of FrostDB is that we have dynamic columns, ones that kind of expand when we see new um, New, new column column names. Um, and dynamic projections now allow you to just say the like dynamic column name. So like in the in the um, Parker case, that would be labels. Um, and it, it'll return all labels, um, no matter um, what the dynamic columns are that um, have been inserted. Uh, so that's a pretty cool feature. Um, I want to say feature-wise, that might be the only big one. But uh, there were a ton of um, correctness <laughs> um, bugs that were fixed, and then um, and like a couple of really really awesome performance improvements. And shout out to Cyril from Grafana uh, for co contributing those. Um, they basically make the ingestion path disappear in all CPU profiles, uh, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, I, I was looking at the like looking up the PR while you were starting to talk about this. So yeah, Cyril did like huge improvements there. Uh, as you can see, there's like a writer pool, and the writers are reused now. So ingesting profiles, yeah, got dramatically better. Or anything really, like it isn't like just profiles that FrostDB can store, right? So anything that's being ingested in FrostDB um, can reuse writers. This is this is really nice. I find like when you're, let's say you're trying to improve read time, you want to build up a database and then run benchmarks against it. And sometimes the biggest database you build, like that's the longest part of the profile, is just waiting on ingest. So that's uh, that's really really great. Um, I saw there was uh, some changes to the table API to support something related to transactions. Um, you can have some kind of like transaction wrapper around. On um, the query execution, um, but I didn't. That's right. Yeah. Do you guys um, know what that is offhand? Yes. I, I just saw the API change, but I didn't see the. Yeah, Matthias, you you contributed this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm trying to to find. Can you the... explain your own uh, solution. Yeah, I can definitely explain that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's this one, right? Yeah, uh, found it. So, um, basically the. The problem is that um, before in, in FrostDB, you could read a schema for a table, and then you have that schema. But if in the meantime, there are transactions or um, like actually ingestions of new data coming into the database, you might have a data race where you then read the actual data, and the data that you actually read isn't consistent with the data uh, for, uh, with the schema that you queried before anymore, right? But that really is just one of the examples, and I think that's the one that was kind of like fixed here. Um, but it is really uh, anything that you read, you want to be able to read consistently. So the way we do this is now we have a view function in the table reader, and you basically uh, call the view function on the table reader, and it will give you the current highest 
uh, watermark for um, reading uh, any data from FrostDB, right? So this transaction ID is just like whenever um, writing something into FrostDB has successfully been completed, um, that will increase the these, this uh, watermark, this high watermark, and then you can start reading data from that point um, into the past, basically. Um, so that keeps on, on increasing the more successful writes we have. And then whatever this um, transaction ID that this function gets, um, kind of like this closure gets, um, gets uh, put into, um, then that's kind of like propagated to reading the schema, reading the data, et cetera, um, so that you can yeah, guarantee that you don't have any um, um, mismatches in the schema. And like um, the arrow libraries will actually panic and complain about this uh, quite um, aggressively. So if you have a schema that's that's mis mismatching the, the data, it will panic. So that's really um, the, the gist of it and, and kind of like a super important aspect um, to, to this PR. Um, trying to see if there's a good uh, example in here where where we use. Yeah, I think this this only has, but yeah, this basically kind of what what you do now. So you 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 say, give me this view, um, um, or put put like uh, call this view function, and it gives you the transaction ID, and then you can use that and. And put that into the iterator or any anything that you read, um, and then you have uh, kind of consistent guarantees that weren't there before. Um, this is super similar to uh, what, for example, uh, BoltDB or any like um, key value store. I guess I should look at the LCD uh, BoltDB more up to date for it. And in here, you can say um, as well, when reading data, um, you always get like a, a transaction a struct. And that was something we were discussing as well. So in the future, we might uh, change this so that you um, need to get one of the transaction structs. And only those uh, structs then have um, specific functions that you can do within that transaction. So you kind of, now you, you just get like a random ID a random transaction ID, just some UN64. Um, but in the future, yeah, the APIs might change so that there's a bit more of a safety in type in terms of type checking uh, and, and what functions you can call. Hope that answers your questions. Yeah, no, it does. I uh, I think I was trying to clean what it did from the code. And so it, uh, um, I think I understand what's going on now. Appreciate that. Um, I'm about to try to update a bunch of stuff in table test.go. And so it, I'll, uh, anyway, I'll be interacting with that yeah. code just yeah. a little bit. Appreciate yeah, let, let, let me know if there's anything that's still unclear after this. Um, yeah, for the concurrency um, uh, PR that you're working on. Yeah, um, nice. I've, uh, I'm making some headway on that this week. I think I've got it almost ready to be re-reviewed another time. Maybe you guys are sick of doing code reviews on it, but uh, OK, cool. Anyway, it's, Never. Uh, it's coming. <laughs> no, we're excited for any update. And every time contributors are pinging us for getting a new update, like that's always like something exciting. I'm, I'm reviewing too many optimals in Frederick's PRs anyway. So I'm, I'm always happy to look at PRs coming from other people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else anybody wants to ask? Uh, maybe I just wanted to uh, comment on like part of why we did this um, consistency um, stuff with the with the views was so that we could generate the arrow schema only once during a query, as opposed to generating it every time a parquet row group is converted from parquet to arrow. Um, because right now, we actually, put, or prior to this, we actually put a lot of um, CPU time into keeping, we, we kept converting parquet schemas to, um, to arrow schemas. And now, at the very least, but like we still need to kind of do that. 
But the only thing that we need to do now is actually do, find out the mapping from the parquet schema to the arrow to the final arrow schema because we know that the arrow schema is kind of the superset of everything we're going to read, um, and so that actually makes reading a whole lot cheaper. Yeah, and the and the mapping is actually super well uh, internally done as well because it just use actually a map. Uh, it maps the column name to the index in the schema, so it's it's just a hash map look a hash map lookup. So yeah, it's gotten way cheaper. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Anything else? Then I think that's it for this week. We are going to be back in two weeks. Um, and in the meantime, please, please, please <laughs> get the uh, release candidates and test them, test them, test them, deploy them on your different clusters, different machines, um, different architectures even, right? We have ARM support now. So that's a really big one to, <laughs> to point out. So install it on Raspberry Pis or whatever, get the binaries. I don't think we have ARM Darwin binaries though, right? Um, but yeah, Linux Linux ARM binaries are there, so you can run it on on uh, Raspberry Pis. If if your Raspberry Pis aren't doing enough work, you can do some profiling on top of that. And yeah, like uh, just just give it a try and 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 give us feedback if anything breaks. And that's performance and bug fixes related. But also always feel free to to tell the Parker project if there's anything that you want to see improved in terms of user experience, et cetera. We always are eager to learn about what we can improve in terms of user experience. Something about, yes, ARM servers released on Google Cloud yesterday. That was super fun. Yeah, need to look into those. <laughs> Come on, anything to add? Uh, I guess for the ARM support, for Parka, we supposed to have different OSs. I'm just checking that. But for agent, we are like already dependent on the Linux APIs for the eBPF, so it will be just Linux. Uh, but yeah, let me just make sure that we have. Yes, we also have Darwin uh, support for Parka, so you can actually run the Parka on a Mac machine if you want. Not Windows though. Pre-compiled. <laughs> Because like we like during development, we uh, most of us use uh, the new MacBooks with the ARM processors, right? So yes, but they are pre-built binaries now as well. That's super exciting. Nice. So I think most of that work was also contributed uh, from uh, outside Polar Signals and open source contributors, which again is super amazing to see. All right. Thanks for showing up, everybody. Um, and yeah, g give it a try. Let us know. And see you in two weeks. Take care, everybody. See you, everyone. Bye-bye.